Uh, good evening, everyone. This is the Mycological Association of Washington. You can see the logo behind me. Uh, this is our October meeting. Uh, I put this together particularly uh, for a little bit of an intro uh, because just I change it around. Honey mushrooms are out on the upper left in profusion, uh, as are beefsteak uh, fungi in the upper right. Uh, and I've got the X next to the destroying angel because they're always worth remembering. Uh, in the center, you'll see uh, rock tripe, uh, Umbilicaria mammulata. I bring that up because uh, it was in the sporophore last month, and uh, it's an emergency food, but then the Cree Indians eat it, and the Japanese rappel down cliffs to eat it. So I figured, how can it be emergency and people risk their lives to get it? So I tried some, and that's what's in the middle of the bottom. And I will, you boil it for 10 minutes, and I will tell you, it is as good in soup as any auricularia or the uh, tree or ever was. Is really good, um, and in the winter, as we're approaching, you can always get it. And lastly, the many-headed slime on the lower right, Fisarium polycephalum. I'm gonna talk about that briefly in the news, so that's why that, that's what that looks like. It's a slime mold. So normally at this point, I would introduce the board, and since we're not uh, in a room, I'll do that here. I'm William Needham, the president. The master of ceremonies on our, and our Zoom master is uh, first vice president Elizabeth Hargrave. Um, and uh, Jared Urchek, who I've not seen in yet, he's uh, our, also runs our mycoflora project. He's the committee chair of that. Secretary, Mary Sol Perez. Treasurer is Matt Cohen, uh, next to Elizabeth there. They are uh, co-located, shall we say, in more ways than one. Uh, programs, uh, Tom McCoy. And almost everything that we've done to, uh, with the virtual thing is really on account of Tom's uh, really excellent work at trying to put together speakers and programs. So everything you see tonight is, is a result of his uh, efforts, along with Mitch, of course, who is the 4A chair, who will talk about mushrooms somewhere in the course. Our membership chair is Rick Silber, newsletter Andy Green, culinary is John Harper, and then the NAMA representative Bruce Porter. So that's the board. So here's our programs uh, that are currently uh, scheduled. Uh, and of course, the first tonight, you know about that. I'll t cover that at the last slide. So next month is bioluminescent fungi. Uh, and you'll see there's a, a, a sub program in every case. Uh, and then chytrids in December, crust and polypores in January. And we're all the way out now to March. Uh, and note at the bottom, all programs will include mushroom identification as an integral part of the meeting agenda in almost every case, maybe dead of winter, this gets a little bit difficult, but I'm sure Mitch will come up with something. So we'll hopefully be able to continue with some sort of, I'm usually gonna do polypores and other things or make up stuff maybe would work. So this is where we talk about the stuff that means running our meeting, uh, running our society, our uh, association. So we have a board of directors. I've already introduced you to that. And uh, we have a, four board meetings a month. Uh, the next one is the end of this month. So if you want to input any of the board members, you email the name of the board position, like president at mawdc.org or secretary at mawdc, or if, it don't, if you just put blank at mawdc, I get it anyway. So that works too. If you have anything you'd like to bring up, we will uh, entertain. And you can attend the board meeting if you want. Uh, the members are welcome. Uh, now, I'm bringing this up because we're at sort of a crossroads. I know you are all sick of elections, probably. If you're not, you haven't turned on TV for a while uh, or read anything. Uh, so, but we have one, and we have one in December, and that means nominations are in November. And the bumper sticker is, if please, two people, anybody, we need two non-board members to be on the nominating committee. John Harper is the board member the culinary chair, I'm asking, I'm beseeching two people to please volunteer. Otherwise, we're gonna have to start pointing fingers and, and, and ask you to not to do so. So please help us out. Um, we will be doing additional culinary and 4A virtual events. I think a couple more, maybe, uh, maybe at one more. We're getting kind of late in the season. Hopefully we'll continue at least uh, somewhat longer. And I'm also here, uh, we're gonna have our first short subject on this DC ballot initiative. Uh, and just keep in mind, this is informational. For your information, we are neither endorsing nor saying yay or nay on this particular issue. We are, we are here to outreach education and not endorsing it as a Maw DC uh, activity. That's for you to decide, and you can decide based on what you're here tonight. 
So the last thing I generally cover, uh, through the month, I'll pick out things that are kind of interesting. The first one was sent to me actually by Tom. Uh, it's a PBS uh, YouTube channel, I think, but it's a wonderful uh, story of what's going on with slime molds. You may have read some of this, but they, they took a map of, of Japan and put slime mold, put food where all the major city was, and then let the slime mold go find it. And it pretty much mapped out the way the train system was set up. So there's some way this stuff networks that does things that are not clearly, it's a single cell, but it, it, it goes after food in a way that is, it makes it la seem like it's intelligent. So the whole idea is maybe this is where intelligence started. So it's really a worth, uh, it's a one hour uh, show. It's, it's definitely, if, if, you're, if you wanna look at Mixomyces, uh, that's a good one to start with. The second one, uh, John Harper sent me. Uh, this is sort of a uh, current events uh, study indicating that uh, common black mold, which is the kind you find in your basement, uh, results, at least in mice, in an increased susceptibility to flu. This being flu season, you might want to keep that in mind. And if you don't think mice are relatively good, uh, you know, indications of what goes on with humans, that's not really the case. Uh, they're closer to us than, than any other animal, uh, with the exception of bunnies. Uh, so everything else, pets, dogs, they're, they're further away in the subphylum chain. Uh, third uh, is in Fungi Magazine. Uh, if you don't get it, you might consider it's a good summary. Talking about the amatoxins and the three genera that they're in, Amanita, Gallerina, and Lepiota, how they got to three genera when they're not uh, transferred by spores. So this is all about what they think is uh, due to... Um, a, uh, it's called transposons, gene transfer. Uh, it's all, there's also an article, and by the way, since it's very timely, uh, the psilocybin or psilocybin synthesizing, by the way. Uh, so that's a new thing in E. coli, apparently. It's in the same issue. And lastly was the Washington Post Magazine, uh, 27 September. And by way of introduction, uh, the name of the article is Who Will Benefit from Psychedelic Mushrooms? And it's about MDMA. Uh, and psilocybin and psilocybin and CS1 is uh, controlled substance one. Uh, psilocybin is a controlled substance in the beginning. And it just, it goes to the whole history. There's been 20 conferences on this uh, uh, just in the last year. So uh, MDMA is, is based by P PTSD. So there are other things out there besides psilocybin. So that's it for fungi in the news. And now let me turn over to the program. And I'd like to introduce uh, Melissa Lavasani. Yes. And they will take it from here. And if you'll stop share and you got it, Elizabeth. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to the Washington Mycological Society. Um, you all play a very important role in all this. Um, you know, I, I think that cultivation will become a hot topic here very soon. Hopefully if things go the right way and um, you all are the experts here. So I really respect what you're doing um, and all the education that you all are doing. It's really important. Um, to formally introduce myself, my name is Melissa Lavasani. I am a Capitol Hill mom. I'm a DC government employee and I am the proposer of Initiative 81, the Entheogenic Plant and Fungus Policy Act of 2020. I'm also chairwoman of the campaign to decriminalize nature DC, the campaign that's supporting Initiative 81. Um, I come here from a very personal place. Um, I treated myself with psilocybin, ayahuasca, and San Pedro. I experienced really severe postpartum depression after the birth of my second child, and I was committed to um, taking the most natural route possible. Um, I had uh, a couple friends that had experience with pharmaceutical antidepressants, and they I had one actually take his own life um, because he could never find relief through that route. And, um, you know, the research behind the pharmaceuticals was not very promising. So I, I vowed to um, work it through talk therapy and all sorts of other alternative treatments. I was trying anything from acupuncture to cupping um, and uh, nothing really helped. I wasn't really engaged in therapy. Um, I could barely get myself out of bed every morning just to go to work. Um, I was, my connection with my husband was broken. I was really disengaged with my children and my life was spiraling out of control. Um, it wasn't until I heard a podcast with, um, from a Joe Rogan podcast that featured Paul Stamets that I learned that psilocybin mushrooms have amazing therapeutic potential. 
had zero experience with any psychedelics before this, uh, and I was, had some real preconceived notions about who took psychedelics and um, what kind of person they were, and I learned that that was all just the propaganda that I was being fed by being a child of the 80s. And, um, you know, I took a chance, and I was in possession of a Schedule One drug, and it, that's a felony, and I could have lost my entire career that I've worked so hard for. Um, I could have lost my family and my life could have gotten ruined if I was caught. But at that moment in time, it was really a life or death decision. Um, I had convinced myself that I didn't belong here anymore and I was making everyone miserable around me. And this is the only way out for me. So um, because of my positive experiences with microdosing psilocybin and later on trying ayahuasca as a therapy, um, I was motivated to start this campaign here in D.C. Uh, the Denver psilocybin decriminalization campaign was happening at the same time as I was healing myself. And I really think that there was a temperature for legislation like this in the East Coast, and especially in the nation's capital, um, the source of all of the unrest in our society right now. Um, how ironic that we would be um, reforming drug laws around psychedelics. So a bit behind the um, legislation that is proposed in Initiative 81. Um, the substances that are covered are um, any plant or fungus that uh, have active ibogan, dimethyltryptamine, mescaline, psilocybin, or psilocin. Um, this, we defined these substances in this initiative as entheogens, which we um, believe will play a part. Um, you know, it's not an entheogen is a term that not very many people know, but we don't feel like it's a term that we feel like can wipe the slate clean of all the propaganda that's behind um, terms like magic mushrooms or psychedelics um, or hallucinogens. Um, this really allows us to redefine these substances as medicines. So um, it's really important for us to keep to define it as entheogens. But the language in the act is asking um, Metropolitan Police Department to make offenses around these natural plant and fungi medicines amongst the lowest law enforcement priority. So I um, mean, it'd still be illegal to sell these um, substances. It's um, you cannot drive in a car. Um, all the other laws would apply, but the, for personal home cultivation um, use these would be amongst the lo lowest law enforcement priority for the Metropolitan Police Department. Additionally, the Attorney General will not prosecute any cases that are brought forward. So we really have this two-pronged approach where, um, you know, if somebody is caught and it was by a police officer who added out for them and wanted to add a charge of possession of psilocybin to them, um, the Attorney General will not move forward in prosecuting any of these cases. So a bit on the background of the initiative. Um, this probably, for some of you, may feel like this has come out of nowhere, but there is a really long history of psychedelic use. Um, not only was there a lot of research in the 50s and 60s on this that was growing before um, the Controlled Substances Act was passed, but we can go back millennia and see that um, some of these substances were used with many indigenous groups. So. Um, these are common practices among some groups and they're socially acceptable and many of them use them ceremoniously to heal uh, various ailments. Um, so I mentioned a little bit before about the research that was happening in the 50s and 60s. As soon as the Controlled Substances Act was passed in 1970 by Richard Nixon, um, all the research that was happening, the momentum that was getting built with psychedelic research was uh, basically cut off. So we have a 50 year gap of um, no research on any of these subjects and they've just now have begun to start looking at um, what the therapeutic potentials are. Um, the biggest institution in our area that's looking at these is, the, uh, is Johns Hopkins University. They have, entire, they have an entire research unit dedicated to um, researching the benefits of psilocybin mushrooms. Um, and the results that they're seeing is very profound. Um, they're, they're having amazing results with depression, addiction, uh, PTSD, um, anxiety around a terminal illness and uh, suicidality. 
So uh, the, the research results around depression have been so positive that the FDA has now granted us psilocybin a breakthrough therapy twice now. So um, the research is very promising. Um, it's still the very beginning. And um, I believe that as the research continues and more institutions come on board, um, we'll have more and more results and we can see uh, what other ailments aside from mental health and what about what other physical ailments can be um, fixed with some of these substances. Um, I mentioned that this movement may seem like it came out of nowhere, but there is a growing movement across the entire country. Um, there are over 100 cities right now that have at least a group formed and that are committed to decriminalizing um, entheogens and um, the first city was Denver. Um, then Oakland followed in 2019 and Santa Cruz followed shortly after that. Um, we are not alone in this November ballot. Oregon has a ballot initiative for um, a, a full medical model of psilocybin therapy if Oregonian voters um, vote yes on initiative 109, I believe it is. Um, they will have, there will be psilocybin clinics set up all over the state where you can sit with a licensed therapist and have a session with psilocybin. So this movement has been picking up speed and I believe that if uh, DC voters vote yes and on November 3rd, um, we can, it can be a real pivotal mo moment for the movement. And I think cities, aside from the ones, our friends on the West Coast, maybe some cities in the middle of the country and um, on the East Coast can continue to decriminalize. Actually, Ann Arbor, a few weeks ago, um, they passed a resolution through their city council and it went through unanimously that they decriminalize um, natural plant and fungi medicines. So this is happening. Um, there's a, a great wealth of public support for Initiative 81. I, um, I'm not a career activist. I am new to this activism game, but um, I was really hesitant to get into this role and uh, be the spokesperson for this campaign because I had no idea how an initiative like this would be received amongst DC voters. I know it was very important for me and impactful in my life. And I didn't, I didn't know if I was going to be the the crazy lady that's endangering her children. Um, but so far, it's, it's been extremely positive. And um, I think that people hear my story and have been, uh, have really relate to me. And um, they understand the importance of this because our current healthcare system is not dealing with some of these issues. And um, society, with the research that's coming out, society needs to um, maybe speak up so our legislators know that this is an important issue and this is solving a lot of really, um, a lot of pr really hard problems for us like mental health. So um, on July 6, we submitted over 36,000 signatures to the Board of Elections. Um, our official number that we got validated on is over just over 25,000. Um, but 36,000 people signed our petition in support and we did it in the middle of a pandemic, which no one has ever really done before. Um, we had, uh, in March, we were supposed to adopt our petition and uh, the pandemic hit right in the middle of March and we had to delay our campaign a couple months and re-strategize. And we sent out a really uh, beautiful mailer with um, a letter from me and a picture of my family and testimonials from DC residents and spokespeople mm -hmm. and our petition, which has never been done before, which we had to lobby DC council to get them to pass this law that just would allow us to vote or to send the petitions out to people's homes. And um, that was really the first time that's ever been done. And um, additionally, we got some laws changed that people could submit their signatures digitally to us as a picture um, that's the first time that's ever happened as well. So, um, you know, we argued that uh, democracy shouldn't die in a pandemic, that uh, we've seen our democracy really deteriorate at a federal level, and it's up to local jurisdictions to uphold these um, practices that engage the citizen and allow us to um, really get into citizen-led democracy. So they passed the legislation. We had a beautiful mailer, and then um, the mail was going just the mail was going as well as it could, as it could have. Um, but we were fortunate enough to have um, 
the city opened up into phase one and phase two of reopening and we began mm -hmm. to get signatures um, out in public and uh, public spaces from social distance. We hired a health and safety officer to ensure that, that we were all practicing the right social distancing and abiding by the laws in the public health emergency. And um, knock on wood, thus far, we've had zero positive COVID cases from our campaign, which is something I'm really proud of. Um, but we uh, persisted and we adapted to campaigning in the middle of a pandemic. It's not easy, but um, it's, it's happening here and we are fortunate enough to be in forums like this where we can speak to you all and educate you about this initiative. Um, in August, we did some polling that indicated that three in five DC voters support Initiative 81. Uh, support had increased nine points since April. And we believe that is a result of us being out in the streets, having conversations with DC voters about this initiative and educating people. And the mailer that went through every registered voter's home um, back in May. So um, we feel pretty confident about this election. Uh, we know that we need to continue educating um, because the more that we educate the voter, the stronger the support is for us. So, um, and we're doing that. We can't really hold public events, but um, we're doing that through building our coalitions and um, seeking out supporters through our networks. And so far we have solidified um, a good amount of public support. Um, most, most recently, it was um, the DC Democratic Party who um, just endorsed us last week. We have the Green Party, um, we have um, Law Enforcement Action Partnership, um, we have a couple of different veterans organizations, um, we have the Stop the, War, Stop the Drug War org. So um, we're trying to get spread the word and we're doing that through um, our networks and the coalitions that we can build. Um, with this um, campaign. So um, most of, I want to note just a couple of things, the common questions that we get or concerns that we get around this uh, reform. Um, Initiative 81 does not change any impaired driving laws. And this has been brought up a few times um, within the campaign. And um, you know, if you're, you are under the influence and you are caught driving, it's just still illegal. Um, also, we are, when we're talking about use of these substances, we're talking about adult use only. Um, anyone caught with these substances under 18, um, that's an entirely different story. It's still illegal and we're not endorsing that. Um, also, Initiative 81 does not legalize or reduce penalties for any of these entheogens. So you will not legally be able to walk into a head shop, for example, and buy mushrooms. Um, this is only for personal use and home cultivation. Um, we are not trying to um, change the laws too drastically. I think that's um, a lesson that we can learn from cannabis reform is that if once these laws change, we need to be educating the public on really how to use these substances safely. So um, our initiative is a very small step forward, but it is an important step in um, ending the war on drugs and allowing people to explore their consciousness through various plant fungi medicine. Um, so um, we're hopeful that we are doing our job as a campaign in educating um, DC voters on these substances and how what what is safe use. And um, we look forward to a, a big yes, hopefully close to 70% <laughs> yes on uh, eight, Initiative 81 on November 3rd. Um, and we will look forward to continuing to speak to DC Council, continuing to speak to the mayor, and continuing to speak to DC uh, voters about um, how the psychedelic movement can help them and what is safe. So um, I will take questions now if anyone has any. Um, thank you so much for having us here tonight. Thank, thank you, Melissa. That's very instructive. Do you have questions in chat room, Elizabeth? We do, yeah. Um, I know the club has had a couple of presentations over the years from the folks at Johns Hopkins who are doing work there with psilocybin, and um, I encourage folks to check that out because their work has been really interesting. And one of the questions um, is about the medical use of entheogens for depression and what we know at this point about how transient or long-lasting those effects can be. 
I mean, so far the results are um, pretty long lasting. I think there was a study where five years later, um, after one psilocybin treatment, the, they still felt the effects of it. And that's just after one dose, one guided trip with uh, um, the program. So um, we're talking about taking a pharmaceutical every day and having um, maybe your symptoms be treated somewhat versus having one dose of psilocybin and having years worth of that effect. Is, that's pretty profound. And you mentioned cannabis legalization in mm -hmm. DC. And one of the questions was, you know, is do you expect the US Congress to pay attention to this initiative and react similarly or yeah, so they already have. <laughs> um, if, I'm not sure if you all are familiar with Andy Harris, but um, he is a, he's in the House of Representatives. He represents the Eastern Shore of Maryland, and he's been really been um, what's prevented DC from having a completely regulated cannabis market. He um, he definitely uses the district as um, his little, his political pawn, and he tried to stop the initiative after we submitted our signatures in July. Um, we weren't sure how he was going to go about this. Uh, the language that he used um, wasn't, it really wasn't a, a, a viable policy or a viable um, thing to work through appropriations. Um, but he did say when he was testifying on this that um, he believes, while he's concerned about safety, he believes that the research supports that psilocybin can be an effective therapy. So if, um, if Andy Harris, a really conservative Republican, can admit that uh, mushrooms have a place in mental health care, then that's really promising that, you know, we can, we will continue this discussion on a federal level and we can speak um, by, in work with um, both parties and, um, you know, the, the science is there. I think that it's really hard to refute this when we have such reputable institutions that are involved in research. So um, if a really conservative Republican um, can try and stop us, but has no support and has no legs to stand on and even admits that um, psilocybin is uh, an effective therapy, that's a really amazing step forward in my opinion. Um. Is anything similar going on in DC? I mean, sorry, in Virginia or Maryland? Do you know? Yeah, so the DCRAM group in Maryland just formed. Um, they are in very early works. Um, they're based out of Baltimore. Um, I think they have a group on Facebook and you, if you want to reach out to them or um, you could send me an email and I can connect you with people involved there. Um, I also believe that there is a, gr a group in Richmond that's working on um, a statewide effort there. These are both very early on in their campaigns. So um, if you want to get involved, this would be a really great time to be get in from the beginning. Great. Um, and someone just posted a, a link to um, to the movie Fantastic Fungi, which also talks about some of the Johns Hopkins work. And if you go on the Johns Hopkins mm -hmm. website, there are um, some great videos that are interviews with people that have gone through their research process. Oh, and someone's posted the, the Baltimore Psychedelic Society too, which I think is probably the group that's behind the... Uh, yeah, there it's, it's some of them <laughs> that are involved in that. So um, if you can reach out to them that you could get connected. Mm -hmm. Um, and then one last question, which was, um, why did you decide to push for decriminalization versus legalization and how much decriminalization sort of, how did you come up with the structure of what you're going for here? So the structure was really driven, um, by what we can accomplish in DC legally, um, because of Andy Harris and the Harris writer, which he has put on our budget a few years ago to prevent um, can, uh, regula a regulated cannabis market. Um, that language says that DC cannot change any um, penalties around Schedule One drugs. So um, 
in effect, we're not, we can't even like truly decriminalize. We can just ask to uh, MPD to move this amongst the lowest law enforcement priority because we're not changing it, any penalties that way. It's a workaround. Um, so un unfortunately our hands are tied with taking this initiative forward anymore until hopefully um, Democrats can take the majority in Senate this November um, and once they do, we have been in conversation with uh, various people in Congress, and um, the first thing, the first thing that they're going to pass for DC is to remove the Harris Rider and move statehood forward for us, where we would have autonomy over our laws and we would be able to change penalties around Schedule One drugs. So, until then, this is the furthest we can take it. Um, but we don't intend to stop here. We intend to move forward um, any way we can. Hopefully it'll be, um, it'll be driven a lot by what happens in November and turning Senate blue. But, um, you know, this is just the beginning. And I, I mean, I know that a lot of people would love for us to move forward and just to go into full bone legalizing, but there is a benefit to moving slow. Um, these substances need to be taken really seriously and um, I, I treat them as medicine and we need to be educating people um, and getting them up to speed in that way as well. And this is an opportunity for us to do that. Okay, thanks very much, Melissa. That was an excellent presentation and your Thank own you. personal story certainly uh, is very compelling about the whole initiation of uh, the idea. Thank so um, thanks for coming and thanks for the information and keeping it, keeping it as information uh, to a welcome okay. audience, I would say. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for having me.